I found a chess game with one of the most savage endings of all time. Oh, and it's also very instructive if you want to learn about the King's Indian defense, but let's be honest, nobody really cares about that. As you probably know if you watched my past videos, I love destruction over the chessboard. Like, when you look at the game and you think, well, this guy probably ended his career right then and there, that's where I get interested. Some men just want to watch the world burn. This game is exactly like that. It was played between past world champion Gary Kasparov I'm sexy and I know it. And four times national champion of the Netherlands, Jeroen Pickett in 1998. Let's get right into it. Wow, I have a lot of energy today. Gary Kasparov played with black, so we're looking at this from black's perspective. We have d4 and knight f6, the king's Indian defense. So the next few moves are pretty much mainline standard. We have the knight development and castles and this fianchetto with the bishop. Now, as you all know, Black really waits for a long time until it puts a pawn in the center. But it controls the center from a distance. We have the knight controlling here and this bishop looking into the center. White played the knight here. So before, if you go back here, you can't just get the whole center because you just lose a pawn. But after this here, now you can play e4 and get the complete center. You don't want to get kicked here, so you play d6. Now I won't go too much in detail with the opening, but if you want a very detailed explanation of exactly this line I'm about to show you, go over to the YouTube channel Chess Geek. He has a very, very good uh, video on this exact opening, and it's a very small channel, so go there and support him. So after d6, preventing e5, we have the bishop development and e5, striking in the, striking in center, finally. Here, black offers white a choice. You can either push through and go into the main line, or you take, I take back, and we trade queens here. This is considered dead equal. And there are actually a lot of draws in this position. On the Leech's database, it says 57% draws. Most players don't want draws, unless you're on Ishgiri. So most players don't actually take here, but they fight for an advantage. So we have castles and knight to c6. Nowadays, knight to a6 is getting very popular, looking to go to b4 with the knight. But back then, in the classical variation, or uh, it, it's actually called the orthodox variation, I don't know why we're getting so fancy about this, uh, knight c6 was the main move. And you're actually provoking d5 here to close up the center. Because this is what black wants. After the center is closed, you can prepare your kingside attack. You don't really want to do a kingside attack with a center that could be opened. Uh, for example here, I could still take and open up the center. And if your kingside is all opened up then, your king is getting very weak. But if we close the center first, now I can go on a kingside attack. So we have this knight to e1 move, which looks very strange. It has kind of a double purpose. First of all, it wants to reroute the knight to the queen side because white usually wants to make a huge queenside attack when black is playing on the king side. The second purpose of this move is that you want to play f3 at some point and get the bishop on this diagonal, because black will play f5 in the king's indian almost always, and then you want to strengthen up the center with another pawn. And this is exactly what we're going to see. We have the knight to d7, preparing for f5, the bishop's going on the diagonal, preparing for f3, f5, and f3. This is very mainline stuff and exactly how you should play the King's Indian, so that's very instructive, pay close attention to this, and also how Gary Kasparov starts to build up the attack now. We have f4, because if your opponent allows you to play f4, you want to play f4 most of the time after you played f5. The second move you want to get in, after the bishop moves away of course, because it's attacked, is g5. This is just textbook attacking in the King's Indian. F5, F4, and G5. Perfect. After that, we have B4 by White. White starts his own attack on the queen side. As I said, Black's trying to attack on the king side, White's trying to attack on the queen side, and we will see who succeeds first. Succeeds? Succeeds. Succeeds? This can't be right. How do you pronounce this word? Succeeds. Let me hear that. Succeeds. Succeeds. All right. Are you stupid or something? And we will see who succeeds first. Black plays knight to f6. We played that away before and now we're going back there because we want our knight very active here. We have c5 attacking on the queen side 
and knight to g6. So far, again, very textbook. You don't really want to take here, because if you would take here, I'd just get a very active bishop, of course. So you can just, like, let white do its stuff, and uh, you can care about that later. So we go here, white takes, we take back, and we have the rook on the open file. White does a very good job at his queenside attack here, preparing all of his pieces, trying to create weaknesses with the pawns. Now, rook to f7 uh, maybe looks a bit strange for the beginner's eye, but it's a very useful move to know in the king's Indian. First of all, it prepares for the king's side attack, because you want to play rook to g7 at one point and line it up with the king for the attack. But it also protects the seventh rank from potential pieces of your opponent going there. For example, this knight really would like to go to c7 to hit this rook. But if your rook is here and this square is twice protected, everything is alright. So white plays a4 and we have the bishop coming to f7. Again, freeing up this rook and also protecting the backwards pawn here, which could be a liability for black. White keeps pawn storming and with bishop to c7. I don't fully understand this move. Usually I really try to fully understand every move I teach. Um, for this case, the bishop of course gets developed a little bit and it prepares to maybe take something on b5. I say maybe because white tries to put something on b5. Either a bishop or a knight would look very good in this square. But sometimes you want to take it and sometimes you actually don't want to take it. It's a little bit strange. It really depends on the whole position and on the situation and I don't fully understand when you want to trade and when not to. In general, this bishop has one very important job, which is to guard e6. Because if white manages to put a knight on e6, black's in a lot of trouble. Just imagine this knight being here. How annoying is that? It covers squares directly in front of the king, it attacks the queen, and it's almost an outpost. It's very hard to get rid of this with another piece. That's why you want to keep your light square bishop for a long time to eventually trade it against a knight on e6. So we have the knight coming to b5, and as I said before, it really looks like black prepared for exactly that and now wants to take it. Like, you move the bishop here to protect this square, something goes on the square, but as those super GMs are, they work, <laughs> they are a little bit like gods, they work in mysterious ways, because Kasparov does not take the knight, he plays g4 instead, going on with his own attack. After g4, we have the knight jumping into c7. And that's actually exactly what you don't want to happen in most cases. Turns out in this case it's completely fine. And uh, white attacks this rook. And black does not give a damn. Kasparov plays g3, attacking this bishop and preparing to open up the king side, not even caring about the rook. In this situation, you don't want to take the rook, you want to deal with the attack first and take the rook second. Because the problem is, if you take the rook, my attack just starts rolling. I play the knight to h5, and you can't really save any of those pieces. Because, for example, if you take the pawn here, which wasn't protected, and save your bishop, I play queen to h4, and this is looking really, really bad for white. First of all, I'm just straight up threatening maiden 1. If you try to change that by playing something like that, I sacrifice my bishop. You take, I take back, and I don't think I have to explain why this is just terrifying for white. There is only one way to stop this maiden one, which is to give away the rook with check, and black is still attacking. So you really don't have time to save any of your pieces. Oh, and by the way, if you're still watching right now, maybe leave me a like and a comment, it really helps to boost the channel. So anyways, you have to deal with this attack, and white decides to play the best move, king to h1. So that if you take, at least it's not check. You take anyway, because, I mean, it's a bishop, you want to take the bishop. And after rook takes, you sacrifice the next piece. Knight to g3, check. You can't take this knight. If you take it, I take back, I have a tempo on the rook. And the computer here plays bishop to d3 to make space for the king here, because after check here and check, you still have a little escape square, but I just keep attacking you with all of my power, and black is much, much better here, despite being down a piece. If you don't move the bishop, but if you try to save the rook, then uh, I don't really see how you are going to prevent this checkmate. 
White of course notices that you can't take the knight and moves away the king. Now I take the knight back and material is actually equal here. The bishop is coming to c4, again making space for the king, and now there's a plan that's so simple but effective it's almost annoying. We have a6. The queen moves up, trying to get some counterplay in, and queen to a7. Kasparov notices that the dark squares are very weak and that the king actually can't get off the dark squares. Now you could use your dark square bishop, but it takes an eternity until the bishop is there where you want to, and he remembers, well, I also have a queen. Now the queen ca can't get on the long diagonal, so I just make way on the long diagonal. Very easy. Kasparov just makes this all look very, very easy. We have queen to a7, white plays b5, still trying to get counterplay. We have takes, takes, and now you can pause the video if you find the savage, almost rude move Kasparov plays here to win a piece. If you found this, I am really impressed because it's the insane looking knight to h1 and white resigns. What's going on? First of all, of course, this attacks the rook, but it attacks the rook in a very stupid way. Like, what's this knight doing here? Now, if you just take the knight, I take the rook, and I'm up a piece. Very simple. I'm just simply up a piece. If we count the material now, we both have a bishop, we both have a knight, both have a rook, a queen, and I just have an extra bishop. Very simple. You can't protect the rook, because if you try to protect it, I just take it anyways. And then I'm up the exchange, and I'm still attacking you. And you can't move it away, because the rook is pinned. This tactic is so stupid, what is this knight doing there? Now why did white resign? I mean, it's only one piece after all. You could still equalize that. So it turns out, when you and I are playing, yes, one piece is most of the time very bad, but we can still equalize it, like there are still chances. When two super GMs are playing, that's a different thing. Also, if you look at the position after, let's say, uh, the king takes, which according to the computer is the best move, and I take the rook, you don't have anything going on for you as white. Now, of course you don't want to trade because you're already down material, the computer suggests uh, moving away the bishop. Now, if I just keep harassing the bishop, I either get a pass pawn, or if you take en passant, I take back, and now you have nothing. What does white have in this position? Black has more active pieces, almost no weaknesses, and is still kind of attacking. This king is weak. Now, this king is very safe, and you can't really attack it. So, whatever you do, I just develop my pieces even more, start attacking a little bit, but with every trade that happens, I'm very happy, because I'm up a piece. And you also have to factor in the psychological aspect of this move. Imagine you are playing the world champion and he sacrifices a piece and lets it hang for five moves straight just to put it on h1 and win a piece with it. I would as well resign here. Like this is the kind of career ending thing I was talking at the beginning. How insane is this? So White was just like, no, fuck that. I'm done with that, and as is this video. Bye.